All right, I think, uh, I think we're ready to, ready to start. So I said, welcome to this session um, and thank you for everyone for taking the time to, to join. Uh, my name is Kim Clerkin. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President of Programs and Events and US Squash. And um, I'm joined today by some uh, of our college coaches and David Pullman, who's the College Squash uh, Executive Director. This call really uh, spawned to a degree from a call we had two weeks ago with the junior squash community regarding the transition process and um, some concerns that I've been hearing on emails and phone calls and also over the weekend at the recent JCT, the, the recruitment season is starting. People are not sure how the pandemic has impacted that process. Uh, they're concerned about the transition to rankings by points and rankings by rating and how that might, uh, they, they may not be accurate right now and how that might be seen by the college coaches. So there seems to be a, quite a lot of concern about this process. And so we wanted to alleviate some of those fears and try and let you know how it will work this year. And so to that end, we have David on the call who I'll hand over to, and then he can, you know, he can uh, introduce the coaches and we can start the session. So uh, David, over to you. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you all for taking the time out of your uh, your busy schedules at the beginning of the school year to join us. Um, we're we're really pleased to see the uh, the number of participants continue to go up as as people sign on. So so welcome and and thanks again for joining us. Um, Den Wilkins just put something in the chat to everybody. If you have questions along the way uh, as we're as we're talking or something comes to you, please please chat all of your questions to Dent, and uh, we'll be. Uh, aggregating those so we cover as much as possible in the short uh, short amount of time that we have today. Um, I'm really pleased and, and grateful to these four coaches for for joining us tonight. They're volunteering their time and and um, you know they have they, we've invited them specifically because um, they really uh, provide a great cross section of our our membership and um, the different perspectives that they bring to the recruiting process and college squash in general. It's a lot of experience on this call. So I'm um, really, again, really pleased that, that you've all planned to join us. Um, first, um, she leads the way in, in lots more than just uh, alphabetical categories, but she's a college squash hall of fame coach. Um, Wendy Bartlett has been at Trinity College for over, over 30 years, um, won national championships, both with individual players and as, as a team, and uh, really pleased to have her here. Wendy Bartlett, thanks for joining us. Um, Next, we have uh, Aaron Robson, a very experienced coach uh, at Mount Holyoke College, um, who provides a great experience and great perspective um, from an all women's college and um, has great experience um, recruiting in the um, in the uh, SEA world and um, and really through up and down the, the rankings of the players. So Aaron, thanks so much for joining us. Um, next, we have Sean Wilkinson. Sean's the head coach, head men's coach at Princeton University. Um, Sean's a former player in, in college squash and uh, also formerly at Bates College. Um, Sean, thanks so much for joining us. And then last, we have Busani Zaba, uh, and one of our newer coaches from Amherst College. Uh, but Busani has has coached at all different levels in squash as well, and he's he's gotten his feet wet uh, during a very challenging time. During, uh, during the pandemic over the last few years, and now he's ready to rock. So we're really pleased to have him here as well. So thank you once again uh, for our four coaches, panelists uh, for joining us, and uh, we'll touch base with you, uh, you four in a little bit. Um, I know we, we probably, our group here has a, a varying level of knowledge about the College Squash Association. So I just wanna talk about uh, the CSA and who we are and what we do. Um, as, a, as a bit of an intro. Um, college squash is not an NCAA sanctioned sport. So, so the CSA is the official governing body for uh, intercollegiate squash in the United States. And that means we uh, administer um, all the day-to-day -day aspects of, of intercollegiate squash, both varsity and club, um, and uh, as well as our championships. And then we, we help direct the strategic planning and philosophy for uh, for college squash, the kind of subset of, of um, U.S. squash uh, in, with the colleges. Um, so we are, uh, we just retooled our, our governance structure uh, about four years ago. So we're still in this iteration of the CSA, although it's, um, it's about 100 years old, uh, intercollegiate squash. Um, we are, we're really pleased with the direction that we're going with an independent board of directors and 
uh, and I'm a full-time employee for the first, something that the CSA has had just for the first time now. Um, as you can imagine, and I'm sure like much, most of you are feeling, our, our coaches and players are incredibly excited about being back in action for the upcoming season. Um, everyone I talk to is really chomping at the bit to get back, back on courts, be back with their teammates, and play that, that team squash that makes um, college squash so unique. Um, coming, in, <laughs> coming into this year, um, we're, we are sporting uh, 34 men's varsity teams and 32 women's varsity teams. Uh, we've just added four new uh, varsity teams that will be beginning play this fall. That's um, Chatham University women, Georgetown University women, and Denison University men and women. Um, so we're, we're pleased that we're increasing our numbers and that's definitely something that we're focusing on moving forward. Um, what that also points to is, is kind of the diversity of our teams and the, and the way that we're looking to grow that as well. Uh, you'll, you'll note Chatham is in Pittsburgh, Denison is in Ohio, Georgetown is in, in Washington, DC. So we're continuing to expand out our geographic footprint and, and that's something that we're looking to do as, as time goes on. And really one thing that we wanna emphasize is that um, if you want to play college, uh, play squash in college, there's an option for you. Between our varsity teams and our club teams, um, the list of schools that sponsor squash is phenomenal and you can really find a place uh, to play anywhere, um, anywhere along the way. So, um, you know, keep in mind that it goes much, the, the breadth and depth of the number of teams that play college squash is, is huge and continues to grow. Um, just, I just received another email about a new team in Tennessee yesterday. So um, this is a constantly growing endeavor and, and we're really excited to be right in the middle of it and helping to, uh, to move it along. I do want to address one more thing. Um, there's questions have come up in the past about the difference between club squash and varsity squash. Varsity squash is just a designation that the schools put on a team because they've decided to um, they've decided to um, allocate resources to the programs in a way that's above and beyond just a student group on campus. The club teams are predominantly student run, student funded, student organized. Um, uh, they provide great experiences and it's a different sort of experience than the varsity experience. Um, and so there are options for you all along the way. Um, the varsity teams have just dedicated those extra level of resources, recruiting wise, um, sports uh, athletic training um, and, and so on to, uh, to make it a little more of a dedicated experience and the commitment is at a higher level as well. Um, so Kim alluded to this before, but our recruiting um, timeline has just gotten started. For those of you who just entered your, your junior year, your 11th grade year of school, um, you may have heard from some coaches uh, already, um, and, and you may not have. It's a fluid process that's just getting started. September 1st of your junior year or your 11th grade year is the first opportunity for coaches to formally get in touch with you and, and be able to have what we call recruiting conversations with you. And we'll hear a little more, a little bit more about that in just, just a few moments. Um, um, the one difference, everything else gets started on September 1st of your junior year, your 11th grade year. The one thing that doesn't is something called official visits. And official visits are visits to campuses that are generally in some, some part, and sometimes all of it paid for by the institution. And those, those are not allowed to start until January 1st of the junior year or the 11th grade year. So as you start to have conversations with coaches, you'll start to hear more about that. It's a two-way street, so you can ask about it and they may, or they may offer it. Um, uh, but it's, a, it's an invitation that's given to recruits that, that um, the, the coaches feel are, there's a connection there. And, uh, and again, we hope that that's built up over the, over the next few months before January 1st hits. Um, but everything, um, yeah, everything kind of flows from here. And uh, if you're, if you are a, the only thing I would say is if you're a rising senior or you just started your senior year, the, the process is not over yet. Um, applications are due generally in, for early decision in, in November. And, and I know there are plenty of coaches who are, who are still looking to recruit and make connections with players. So uh, we'll hear more about that as well. Um, so, um, why don't I, um, start with a basic one and, um, we'll go, we'll go in order that I introduced you, Wendy and Aaron and Sean and, and Busani. 
can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, with, with COVID being such an interrupter over the last uh, year to 18 months, you know, how do you, how have you been able to see recruits? How do you, how do you, when you communicate with people, what, what do you tell them in order so that you can say, you know, I, I've, I've been able to see you play and, and I want to see more. Well, I think uh, particularly with last year with the COVID and not many um, of the juniors being able to play, the videos became very, very important. So even if it's a was a video of you, you know, training with somebody, uh, competition is usually the best. But um, after last year, you know, the videos were, turned out to be really very, very important in terms of viewing um, the junior players. Thanks. Um, I would I would just add to that that um, I really appreciated U.S. squash um, and and clubs live streaming matches um, because that allowed me to see many players that I probably wouldn't have seen in um, you know typical normal times. So um, so I watched a lot of those matches and I totally agree with Wendy that the the videos, I tended to ask for more videos than I have before, just because I couldn't find um, anything from a recent tournament. I think that's absolutely right. I think, you know, the streaming um, with those showcases was incredibly helpful. Um, I think right now I'm trying to develop a kind of stock list of questions. And one of those is, do you have videos that I can watch? Um, and, you know, where are they? I, I do, my suggestion with that is, you know, to have an unlisted video on YouTube that you can share with coaches so it's not public. Um, that way it's very easy for me to track where it is, you know, just in terms of storage and email space. I think that's just a good practice to have them online somewhere. They're easy to, they're easy to kind of link to. Um, but yeah, that's how I've been primarily doing it. And obviously as we now move into the next phase, as many tournaments as we can possibly get to and allowed to go to, we will do that. Sean, Sean Bassani, before you go, Sean Bassani, can you talk a little bit about, um, what, you know, I think that's a great suggestion, Sean, about the YouTube videos, you know, technology um, is, is definitely our friend and, and is, you know, people are developing new technologies all the time. So, so we definitely encourage the use of that. Can you talk about what sort of content you, you like to see in the videos so that you get a, a good sense um, while we're still kind of working our way through COVID? Uh, yeah, unedited videos, I think are great, especially if they're match play. Um, you know, I don't particularly enjoy watching videos where I only watch someone winning rallies. And, you know, I think it's, it's more helpful for me anyway, part of my recruiting process is to see what you do under pressure, how you respond to pressure. Um, having some sort of score widget on there is also helpful, but I know, you know, we're kind of getting into the video editing point now. And, you know, I don't think there's any real need to do that, but if you have one that has some sort of way we can follow along the score, that's helpful. Identifying yourself to in a video, critically important. You know, the number of times I get a video and, you know, if it's two people and I, you know, it's really difficult to tell depending on the camera angle, who's who. So definitely having some sort of identifier in there, whether it's, hey, I'm the guy in the red shirt or the green shorts, or whatever it might be, I think is helpful. Um, and, you know, I think there's something you can start to develop as a catalog of videos. I think it's pretty easy to do now. And, you know, not knowing a somewhat uncertain future, I think, as we, you know, as you have tournaments and opportunities to record these videos, I'm definitely encouraging all the kids I'm talking to to do that while we still have the ability to continue to do that. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds, but definitely cataloging that is, is, a, is a good idea. I don't know if that answered the question, David. Um, yeah, that's great. Bassani, anything to add? Yeah, no, I'd say, um, I think what, um, I'd say what Aaron um, said a short while ago has been extremely helpful to see um, the streaming from US Squash because we've been able to see actually more players than we would normally travel to tournaments for. Um, but um, also to Sean's point about, um, you know, what content you want, you don't, We, I can speak for myself, I'm not so keen to see someone being fed by their coach because it gives us no information about their real, you know, their playing level and the ability to, you know, how they react under pressure. So um, as authentic as the footage can be, um, there's better for us to get to know the person and you know, and obviously, you know, uh, you know, being able to, you know, sp you know, do a lot of you know, do some zooms and speak to people on the phone, that has been uh, in a good combination for us. 
Excellent. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to transition a little bit and just talk about um, your your kind of you know three thousand foot perspective on recruiting as a whole. Um, you know we're we're aware and the coaches are definitely aware of of the um, the reinstitution of points based rankings that just came about in a, in a tournament play just came in um, and I so coaches uh, and we'll go backwards to start with uh, Basani this time you know how do you how do you view rankings as as a part or a tool of your your grander recruiting process. You know, rankings are an indicator, um, but, you know, I'm lucky enough that I've spent uh, the last 10 years coaching juniors, um, you know, around the country. So I've watched um, quite a quite a few juniors that may not be ranked highly, but have, um, you know, are actually a fairly good standard. And it could be geographical issues. It could be, you know, that then, you know, they're in schools that don't allow them to travel, it could be that they can't afford to travel. So, um, you know, ratings have been, for me, I feel ratings are, are truer because if people are playing in box, if, if juniors are playing in box leagues, um, we can, you know, I also get an idea as to what true level they are. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't concentrate too much, you know, solely on the, on, on, on the rankings. Sean, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I apologize if my head is is shining in the in the light here. I realize things Let's get has a negative. Um, it, it's really strange, you know. I'm the ranking chair for the CSA, but yet I pay quite little attention to junior rankings in general. I think they're I think they're great, and I think they're a good starting point. But what I'm looking for is trends more than anything else. Um, I would not panic about the change that U.S. squash has made. Um, you know, all the coaches that I've talked to, and I think we talk quite often. You know, we're looking at trends over a long period of time. We're not just looking at a at a snapshot. You know, I had a call with someone this morning who was worried that they had lost earlier than they than they wanted to in the JCT. I hadn't even noticed that, to be honest. You know, I'm looking at you know how they're doing over the course of time versus just one period. Um, and so for me, it's a good data point, but there's so much more holistic analysis that goes into recruiting someone than just simply black and white data on, you know, on a page. We understand that, you know, after all, you know, they're kids, they're 15, 16, 17 years old, they have tons going on, they could have just gotten off a red eye somewhere and they didn't play well that morning, whatever it might be, and that will impact the ranking. So for me, I'm trying to dig much, much deeper into a recruit than just simply a rating or um, or a ranking. Obviously, we use it, you know, to to give us a rough idea of who we should be talking with. But beyond that, there's so much more that goes into recruiting than just than just a ranking. And that's weird because I'm the ranking chair of the CSA. But um, yeah, you know. Aaron, Aaron, and Wendy, can you give some examples of other other um, other things you look at as part of your recruiting process beyond the the rankings? Um, well, one thing I think about is, um, you know, what other what other interests the student athlete has and, you know, if they're possibly playing another sport and um, and, you know, just a little more holistically, um, you know, what what school will be the best fit, knowing that um, finding the right fit is so important um, to being successful in, you know, your academics and your squash. So. Um, I think, interestingly enough, for admissions, they like to know that someone is ranked, but the ranking isn't so important. And that's just to confirm that, yes, you are actively participating in your sport. And um, for me, I like to just see, you know, that you're, you're out there, you're competing. But in the context of the pandemic, um, you know, it's been incredibly hard for some for some students to get back into it. So we all understand that. And I really like looking at tournament results individually, not the not necessarily the ranking, but just, you know, looking to see, you know, what happened in a tournament, who did you play, um, you know, what happened in the consolation draw. So it definitely goes way beyond a ranking and even a rating because um, there's so much more to the story than that. Yeah, just to pick up what um, everyone else has been saying, definitely um, the rankings and ratings pay, play a very small role. It's for me, 
I, I get the most information and feedback from watching tournaments, going to tournaments and watching players play, even if they lose three, two, if they have really shown a lot of heart and are playing hard and digging down and showing great sportsmanship, that's great. I, the, the score at the end of the day, doesn't matter as much as how they are as a person and, and as a player. So seeing a player in person is the best. Next best, best thing is video uh, competition. Thanks all. Kim, you wanted to jump in quickly with, uh, with some additional thoughts on the rankings. I did, because I've been talking a lot um, at the JTT this weekend, and I had the under 17 age group, and also fielded quite a few questions today with the rankings coming out. And uh, particularly in the girls' side, there's a lot of girls who are playing in different divisions, and they're not sure whether they should be playing in their own age division or an age division up, um, and what the coaches are looking for. But so what I'm really hearing here is that it, it doesn't matter necessarily which division that you're playing in. You're looking at, you know, if I'm looking at individual match results, you're not worried so much about the ranking in an age division. Is that is that correct? Yep. Yes. I think that, I think that will help the, the, the girls, especially as they try and figure out where they're going to get their most competitive matches this year. Thank you. Great. Definitely. Thank, thank you all for the, the questions that are coming in. Keep sending them, chatting them to, to Dent Wilkins, um, who's helping us in, in the background tonight. Uh, we really appreciate the engagement. Um, the next question I'll, uh, I'll direct to Aaron. Uh, Aaron, how, how do you like um, recruits to keep conversations going with you as the process is going on throughout the year? Um, what's, what's, what's some examples of ways that you've, you've been able to sustain those conversations? Yeah, I think that's that's probably something that differs from from coach to coach. So um, I think that I think it's really important to establish, you know, um, you know, how does the coach want to stay in touch with you? Sometimes coaches will ask you how you prefer to be contacted, whether you, um, you know, are OK with phone calls or texts. Um, so it's just, you know, a matter of um, establishing that relationship. Um, and, you know, I think that if you're interested in, in a school being responsive um, and maybe having an email that is devoted to your college search so that, you know, you don't get too overwhelmed with finding, um, you know, where emails are and staying, staying organized with that. But um, um, I think that, um, regular follow-up, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if it's every two weeks necessarily, but I would say, you know, when you have something that you think is important or when you have a question, you know, don't sit on the question, um, you know, ask a lot of questions and, and ask good questions that, that you really have rather than, you know, um, sort of skirting around the around the outside of a, a question, just be very direct. Um, I think direct communication with coaches is, is a good way to start getting direct feedback right back to you, which, which in the end is gonna be most helpful to you when you're making your decisions. Yeah, I think that's, that's great perspective, Erin. And I think direct, but courteous too, uh, professional, it makes a big difference, um, you know, uh, Keep in mind that these these folks are they are evaluating you as people, and there's a certain level of professionalism and, and courtesy that they're looking for. Um, you never know who's listening or who's paying attention, and and uh, being a good citizen that's that's something I keep harping on myself. Being a good citizen is is almost more important than anything else, and uh, and that goes to your written communication as well as your your verbal or your in person communication. So keep that in mind. Busani, can you talk a little bit about how you like to sustain conversations over the over a recruiting process? Absolutely. Um, I, I think um, to Aaron's point, I think it's a preference of uh, you know of the student. I do a combination of um, you know, text, phone calls, and 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 Zoom, depending what the topic is. Um, you know, I find you know particularly if we're we're in season, you know, it could be. You know, it could be that a text will go a long way. Coach, I'm playing at this time. Um, you know, just to let you know. So I think it's I, I'm I'm comfortable with any of those three ways. But um, you know, I also think um, I think your comment about being a good citizen. I'd focus on you know the person, you know, the quality of 
of individual and we see this at junior tournaments watching people play i think sometimes coaches would rather you know a lesser player um you know for a better person so i would totally um you know I'd like to emphasize that point thanks i'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we'll pull in wendy wendy and sean because this is um i know you you in particular uh, amongst this group have experience on the international front um do you look at international recruiting differently what's what's that process like for you um you know, we have there, especially in COVID, if you can address that as well with, with players, possibly from, from countries, even from Canada who can't make it into the U.S. to play. Um, is there anything different that you look at or, or um, how do you assess that? Wendy, if you could start. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, international recruiting is, is very different from the U.S. recruiting because the educational systems are, can be very, very different. So I think the more the international player is attuned to what the US colleges and universities want and need, the better. And I do think the international players have to be really a lot on the ball and really understand what the system is over here. And that makes things a whole lot easier. So for example, sending a transcript from their French high school, that's all in French doesn't help you know they if they could you know know that they have to have an official uh translated transcript that that makes a big difference in the process and to make sure that your the emails are in english and they're you know very well written and the texts are well written uh and speaking is uh very uh well spoken that also helps a lot and if, you know, obviously with the COVID again, not being able to watch them play, the whatever videos and match play they have, competitive play, that also, um, that is very powerful. Sean, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think from a process and logistics standpoint, we treat it much differently. I think what Wendy said is exactly right. You know, we, we try and make sure that we're recruiting, you know, bright and talented players as best we can. And with that comes, you know, a lot of responsibility on the student athlete to produce, you know, stuff that we need in a timely fashion. You know, I don't think we hold, you know, whether it's domestic or international kid to a different standard. I think, you know, we, we require similar standards across the board as much as we can, at least in our communications. And obviously, you know, the admission standard is the admission standard, and that's an entirely separate conversation. But um, no, I mean, I think especially during COVID, it's difficult to evaluate anyone right now, whether you're a U.S. player or an international player. I, I, I don't know if we have enough data right now on the U.S. kids, you know, tournaments and, you know, appearances and things like that to make too many judgment calls at this stage. Um, and we certainly don't have it for the international kids. I think, you know, where we recruit from, you know, most of those international tournaments have been canceled. And so that's a huge hit for the international players, right? There's no British Open again this upcoming year. The World Juniors was canceled. Um, and so we've got to be creative in how we evaluate some of those international kids who may not have, you know, the infrastructure that U.S. squash has provided for the U.S. players. And I think what U.S. squash has done is far and above anything I've seen anywhere else in the world. Um, and, you know, we search the globe. So um, I think there's definitely an advantage there for the U.S. kids. It makes our lives significantly easier as coaches at the moment. So building on that a little bit, um, can we just uh, take a step back and kind of from a basic level, you know, what are, what are coaches allowed to do? Are they, they allowed to, to travel to tournaments? Do they only go to JC, JCTs or do they go to golds or silvers or bronzes? What, what, are, what do you, um, you know, how do you evaluate that and do you do you, are you able to go in person as things start to open up are you planning to go more in person what's your approach uh basani why don't you start us up um i think uh i can speak from what i've learned uh, what happened here historically is that you know they went to the coaches went to you know the us open as one of the you know main main events and um you know sometimes I'll speak for 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 our program is sometimes it's budgetary not all coaches can go to all events but you know there's a lot of events that are that are local to you know that are local you know like 
you know, in Connecticut, in Boston, I feel like those you can go to in, in a day and I will plan to, to doing that, you know, place like New York, I can get to, but, um, you know, in the summer, you know, plan to go a little further going, going forward, um, for, for, for our, for our program. But, um, you know, when I was at Dartmouth, we, you know, we went a little further, went internationally and, um, we also, you know, did the, you know, nationals and the, and the JCTs, but, um, you know, uh, specifically to us, we're, you know, clo closer to, closer to, to home is what, what we've done. But for example, this summer we went to a gold in, in San Diego, um, and, you know, just to, you know, see a different geographical area. Aaron, what's your, uh, what are your capabilities? Where do you, where do you like to go? Where do your peers like to go? Um, I, I find that I need to go to um, a, a wide range of tournaments. So I definitely like to go to the U.S. Open. Um, and I also was out in San Diego this summer because there are so many juniors playing on the West Coast now. And that's really exciting. So I want to, um, you know, just get get the name out over there. And um, um, I also need to go to silver tournaments because um, there's really good squash being played, you know, right on through um, all the rankings. So, so I go to a lot, a lot of different events and uh, I definitely try to use the geographic area that I'm in um, in order to stretch the budget a little bit. But um, I definitely will be going to the West Coast at least once um, a year um, moving forward. Um, for uh, Wendy, it's kind of building on that even further. If if someone if you just have missed somebody um, or you're you're at an event or you couldn't get to an event for for either geographic or budgetary reasons or otherwise, um, what's what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? Did, should they wait for uh, for the coaches to reach out to the players, or is it okay for recruits to reach out? What what's your uh, general take on that? Yeah, I think it's a, a combination of both. Uh, you know, the coach reaching out um, many times and vice versa, uh, the player reaching out. Um, it's always, I think, a little bit better. I don't know how the other coaches feel, but if the player reaches out, that that shows that they're really interested. And that is, that that's a, that's a plus. That's a plus. The more interest that they show, um, I feel the better because every school's different and there's something for everybody. So if they're really interested in Trinity and knows what Trinity's about or want to learn more about Trinity, then that can that really starts up the, the whole process and the connection. Excellent. Just an editorial note um, for those, um, I know we talked a little bit about the timeline and how the recruiting process starts really in earnest on September 1st of your 11th grade year. Um, players, recruits can reach out, you know, sophomores, freshmen can reach out to coaches to introduce themselves. They should just not expect to get a response. Um, you can do it earlier in preparation. You know, for example, this, the JCT that just happened this past weekend, um, you can let coaches know ahead of time, you can reach out, take the initiative and let them know where you're going to be or when you're going to be playing. Um, so that they're aware of it even before um, even before the recruiting conversation or contact deadline starts, um, you just be just be mindful and and realistic that 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 email is not you know should not elicit a response from any of the coaches until after the deadline. Um, so just just kind of important to keep that in mind. Um, that goes that goes a little bit to you know we talked about timeline and the starting point. Um, uh, you know, the, the junior year is when the contact with the coaches can happen, but um, in partnership with U.S. Squash, we share um, the list of rankings and the names with uh, high school graduation years attached with all of our coaches uh, going back to the U15s. So um, again, kind of, kind of the overarching theme is this is, this is a fluid process and, and coaches are keeping track of of the trends and the results and the interactions that they've seen um, far before, uh, in a lot of cases, before um, you know the junior year begins. And so, um, 
in, in some of our previous presentations, which you can access on, on the US squash website and also the CSA website, um, we talk about it starting, you, you become a, what we call a prospective student athlete when you enter your ninth grade year. Um, that doesn't mean that coaches are on you right away in ninth grade. During that time, we really ask you to focus on your academics. Um, you know, squash by and large, the expectations of, of the schools and Sean, I'll maybe point to talk to you a little bit about this, but um, all of the all of the schools represented here and, and almost all the schools to to a, to a letter in the CSA expect very high uh, academic rigor and very high academic success of their of their student athletes. And so you have to start that from the day you enter high school. Those transcripts are going to show up on coaches desks. And if you're not ready to get going from from ninth grade year on, then uh, then you're going to have some catching up to do. And um, so. Um, Sean, can you talk a little bit just your wide range experience of um, academics and how they fit into the process and, and kind of how that plays out over time? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, um, it's a it's a very complicated kind of equation. So, you know, I'll try and be you know, as brief as I can. Um, I think to David's point, I think, you know, we, you know, I think all the institutions that I know of that I've definitely worked at and that I, you know, compete against, we all require, you know, the four years of academics to be admitted to, you know, to any of the institutions. So starting the ninth grade, it's definitely time, you know, to take academics seriously. Um, and also taking, you know, some difficult courses. I think that's pretty important. The workload needs to be representative of the general student population at your school. You know, if you're, if you're taking all the easiest classes, you know, all of our institutions across the board have got pretty rigorous admissions offices and they understand exactly what the rigor is at each school, especially domestically, you know, and internationally, you know, they hire outside auditing firms to kind of figure out what the rigor is at these international schools. And I've had to go through that numerous times. Um, and so definitely if there's any sort of trend in your academics it needs to be positive so you know if you have a rough transition you, you you know you're transitioning schools or you know whatever it might be and you have you know somewhat rough freshman year definitely by the time you hit sophomore and junior year there should be an upward trend in the academic output that you're you know that you have and i think that's critically important to any admissions officer wherever I've worked, you know, I did a stint at Bates, at Brown, at Drexel, um, and now obviously here and across the board that has been true in every single case. Um, the downward trend after sophomore year tends to be a little bit more of an indicator uh, that something's not right. And, you know, that requires a much deeper explanation into what's going on. Um, but definitely, you know, broad spectrum of classes, make sure you're taking your core courses. Uh, more core courses over electives is definitely what I've seen across the board um, as being important. Um, sciences, math, English, you know, all of those things are critically language important too. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much, pretty much it. Uh, other coaches, anything else to add about academics and how that, how that factors in to your process? No, it's pretty, we kind of covered it. Um, it's, it's important and <laughs> it's, uh, and it's something to focus on from, from the, the beginning of high school. So, I mean, um, yeah, can I just add something about please. that? I, yeah. I missed the part about how it plays into the recruiting process. Um, and this isn't, you know, to scare anyone, but you know, it's number, it's the first thing I look at when someone emails me is, can I admit this student or not? Can can I have, sorry, let me rephrase that. Can I have, you know, the support of the admissions office to go through that process and this person be admitted? And no coach in, in the CSA makes any sort of admissions decisions that comes from the admissions office. You know, all we do is present a candidate, um, you know, with our support and hopefully the admissions office views that kindly. Um, but, you know, having done this for a number of years, I have a rough idea of what the admissions office would like to see. Um, but that is the first thing I look at. There's no point going down a road if I don't think the admissions office would like that profile. Great, great addition, Sean, thank you. Um, transition to a slightly different topic. If you, if you were, um, if you're a, a junior and you're right here at the beginning of the, of the recruiting process, how, this will go a quick lightning round. I wanna hear from, from all four of you just to get the, the varied perspectives. We'll start with uh, Basani. Um, how, how do you prefer to um, accept a, an introduction from a, from a recruit that you're hearing from for the first time? Um, you know, we've talked about different modes of, of conversation, but can you give us an example of, of when you're hearing from someone the first time, what that introduction uh, should or could look like? Yeah. Um... 
I, an email uh, an email introduction I think is you know, co you know helps cover uh, the most important pieces and um, it's obviously you know talking a little bit about your your you know your squash squash history academic history um, you know and also talking about you know why you know Amherst is where you you feel you you'd like to you, you'd like to what that you got interest in Amherst. Um, and um, and also, um, you know, yeah, and also, I, I guess after that, talking, you know, maybe we could move into another form of uh, communication, but email, I think, is the best one of all. Wendy, what do you think? Um, email, definitely start off with email. Um, I, I'm not particularly, you know, uh, when recruits overload and send you all kinds of attachments and this and that, I, what I prefer is um, for them to fill out the recruit. I'll answer the email, ask them to fill out the recruit questionnaire. As soon as I get the recruit questionnaire back, which is all the basic information I need, then I give them a call and we arrange a time to call. And then I, I really like the, the phone connection as well as uh, text emails after that. But the most important thing to me is the phone call after they fill out the recruit questionnaire. So that's that's an important point. Wendy brings up, it's called a recruit questionnaire. Um, a lot a lot of schools, I, mean, I can't say that all of them do, but a lot of teams have, um, it's an online survey form effectively that that gets emailed directly to the coach's inbox. And it has like, like exactly like Wendy says, it has all the critical information, kind of the demographic information, contact information that coaches need to get back in touch with you. And um, so filling that out, getting, you know, asking a coach where that link is or, or finding it on the team's website, which is generally where it's available. That's a great way to, to get into a coach's database pretty much right away. Mm -hmm. Aaron, you have anything to add? Yeah, just to emphasize that um, you don't have to wait for the coach to direct you to complete the recruit form. I completely agree that, you know, that might be something that you do proactively and then let the coach know when you have completed the form um, because that will just um, you skip a step. And, um, and they are very easy to find on most websites. So, um, and it's really important for us to have the, the contact information that you want us to have and that we should be using um, because maybe the contact information that you're using for US squash isn't your preferred contact information for the recruiting process. So we really appreciate um, you know, having direct communication with the student athlete and, um, and also the parents, but, uh, but it's really nice to have like all of the contact information and even contact information for your coaches, um, you know, especially during this time where it, it can be nice to get some, some added context, um, you know, so, so completely filling out the recruit form is, is extremely helpful. Excellent. I think that gives us a, a, a pretty wide breadth. Um, you know, in, in previous, for those of you who've been tuned in for a couple of years, we, we've talked about the idea of something called like a squash resume. That's, that, that, you, that can be in, in many different forms, but it, it effectively covers what, was, what we just talked about. Not all the critical contact information that you want coaches to have and a, and a small story telling, you know, being able to communicate your story about, about who you are, where you're coming from, what your goals are and, and things like that. Um, there are lots of ways to do that. It doesn't have to be in a big, a big long overloaded attachment. So be mindful. Coaches are, are getting contacted all the time with lot, from lots of different directions. And so um, as Aaron has said, and actually as everyone has said, um, direct, simple uh, communication, uh, but courteous and professional is, is really meaningful to the coaches. Um, can we talk about... Uh, test optional is any of any of the four of you maybe you can raise your hand are schools test optional still this recruiting cycle or have we have we reverted back to to uh test mandatory in terms of standardized tests are we test optional raise your hand yeah busan is amherst trinity is test optional sean i see you on mute you have something to add? uh for which year i'm working on two cycles so yeah um so is it split i guess it's kind of the question is it going back to I think it's split. So the current high school seniors are test optional, but we don't have guidance on the juniors. Oh, I, 
Um, but Aaron, Aaron, Wendy, and Busani, you're all test optional for now for the foreseeable future. Yeah, so that that gives you a good sense, everyone, how things can progress differently at different um, at different colleges, and and that's something else I, I'd like to focus on is as you start to narrow down some of the schools you're interested in talking to, it's really incumbent upon the recruits to do some research and understand the policies, the timelines, the dates, the the due dates for um for documentation or applications at the different schools that you're looking at because almost everyone every one of our schools is different they have different options for applications in terms of early decision regular decision early decision two, uh things like that so um really understanding that being able to communicate about that with the coaches shows that they're you know you're, you're showing an active interest in their school and, and understanding the different parts of it so being mindful of that is is important um, even when things are test optional, if you feel like a standardized test is going to help your uh, help your your total application package, um, you should feel free to take the test. But if it's test optional and you feel like it might hurt your application package, then maybe you have a different strategy uh, to doing that. Uh, a lot of this is in a personalized process, and so you have to understanding what the expectations are from the schools and then how that fits into to your profile and and how you can best put your uh, put yourself forward. Um, is, is an important way um, to approach it um, and just being as, as mindful of all, those, of, of all the different factors. Uh, another question we've gotten um, is about extracurriculars outside of squash. How important um, do you think um, you know, extra, extracurriculars, other activities besides squash is as, as part of a, a whole package in the recruitment process? Um, uh, Aaron, why don't we go to you with that? Um, I think it's important to uh, to have genuine interests outside of outside of your sports. But um, uh, one thing that seems to stand out with admissions office officers is the leadership roles that you may have. Um, so you know, getting involved in something that you really care about and then sticking with it so that you do eventually take on a leadership role. Um, I think that can be meaningful. Um, I've also heard many admissions um, staff across other campuses say that they understand that you're under a lot of time pressure with your sport, if you're playing your sport at a high level, um, and you're, you know, taking a rigorous curriculum of, of courses, then there's a limited amount of time in your schedule. So, so I think there is some understanding that you're not going to be able to do everything. Um, and uh, so, so I think it's important to really do what is meaningful to you so that you'll, um, you know, get the most out of it and not necessarily do things and choose activities because you think that it's going to present well as a candidate. Um, because I think that they're pretty good at kind of sifting through all of that too. Wendy, do you have something to add about extracurriculars? Yeah, um, for us at Trinity, very low priority. We'd rather see really good grades and really good squash. So again, you see you see some differences there. Um, uh, Sean, I want to ask you specifically, since you have some experience at, at, at Drexel, um, there's a question that came up about about squash specific scholarships, athletic scholarships, um, how 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 those are available if they're available, and and how one might go about acquiring one. So I'm pretty sure that currently the only two schools that offer athletic scholarships for squash are UVA and Drexel. I, you, David, you would probably have more information on that. Um, and I, and I think, you know, each department will allocate a sport a certain amount. If you're an NCA sport, you're regulated by the NCA with a number of scholarships you can offer. And that's generally done by a dollar amount. Um, and so for squash, you know, I think that's still kind of up in the air right now with how many scholarships each place can offer. Um, I would say this, that I, in my time at Drexel, very few kids are on what, we, what you would consider to be a full scholarship. A scholarship is any dollar amount awarded to a student. So it could be $10,000, it could be the full ride. And that's, you know, in my experience, that was up to the coach to determine, you know, the dollar amount that we offered to every kid. And generally, I would say, you know, we did that on a need-based system. So, you know, if your family could afford, you know, to pay 50%, we would try and make the rest up in, in what was known as scholarship um, and scholarship dollars. 
I don't know how that's going to progress, you know, as things change and evolve in the CSA and, and the NCAA at large. Um, but, you know, for, ten, for instance, tennis has only allowed a certain number of scholarship kids on each roster at the Division One level. Um, we do not have that regulation to my understanding and knowledge at this point for squash. Um, and so it's a little bit unregulated, but it's difficult to have a regulation for two schools. Um, you know, I think one thing that gets banded about is I think there are a lot of, you know, confusion around financial aid versus scholarships. And, you know, I know there are a ton of schools that are need blind financial aid. There are some schools that offer financial aid for international students and some that don't. And so again, to one of David's earlier points is researching these institutions that you're interested in will lead to a lot of clarity around that financial aid scholarship question. Um, I don't know if that, that yeah, does it. That's, that's great. That gives a good idea. It's relatively, it's a relatively low uh, occurrence in, in, our, in our college squash world. Um, but there are other ways to acquire financial aid through different colleges um, and universities. Different institutions have, have uh, there are lots of options, ways of applying for, for scholarships through your academics, through your extracurriculars and so on. So again, you know, being rigorous in your research and finding opportunities to, to find where that money is available is, is definitely worth, worth your time. Um, we got a question about how, how much the timeline can vary. Um, so, uh, you know, Wendy and then Basani, maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the first opportunity to recruit being September 1st of your, of your junior year. Um, how, where do your offers fall? Like, where does, how does your process play out from kind of that point forward through the actual application uh, during their senior year? Well, um, we're both part of uh, NESCAC and NESCAC in general, um, it's junior year, September 1st, when we can have contact with, with the squash player. And then uh, spring, you, uh, we can have unofficial visits. And then the senior year, they can have an official visit. Um, I think in general, this one you can um, add to this. I think in general, the NESCAC schools, well, at least Trinity, we're a little bit, um, let's say, we have to wait until after the pre-week on July 1st before we can make any offers or any commitments to any of the players. Uh, we do encourage for really good players and good uh, students, uh, early decision one, that uh, tends to be the best round or uh, early decision two. And early decision one is November 15th and early decision two is February 1st. I, I feel like in general, the Ivies tend to have a little earlier commitment process, uh, but definitely with the NESCAPs, it's later. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with, um, with Wendy on, on, on all of that. So our timelines are, are identical and um, yeah, we tend to get, um, you know, students sort of saying, you know, oh, you know, the Ivies in particular are, you know, are offering me a spot um, you know, can you make your decision? And the answer is no, we can't. We're restricted by, you know, the NESCAC regulations. Um, so yeah, so in general, we're also making, you know, making offers after July, July 1st um, to, to any prospective students. Yeah, and I think that's a critical point. Some, some, some kind of verbal or conditional offers are, are made earlier in the process and some are some are made much, much later, um, even in the beginning of the senior year or as, as the application process is ramping up and even into regular decision, which, which tends to happen in January of a senior year. So uh, again, that fluidity that we've talked about continues to, to come back up. Um, we're, we're gonna take uh, or sorry, handle some questions through eight o'clock. Uh, so we have about five more minutes, but I do, I do wanna emphasize, thanks to, ten, uh, thanks to Dent, we've, um, he's attached the College Squash Association Frequently Asked Questions link uh, in the chat. So we encourage you to access that. And um, we also encourage you to stay engaged. Um, uh, I will be at events in the future. Kim is learning more and more every day and will be, and, and her staff know, know a lot about this stuff. Some of them have lived it as well. So um, continue to ask questions. And I think most importantly, um, as you have specific questions, when you can converse with the coaches, ask those questions directly to the coaches and they'll be able to help you and answer you. We're all, 
we're all keen on on encouraging growth and and having having a lot of um, junior players access college squash. And so we're we're always interested to um, to handle those questions and um, and uh, yeah, so keep them coming. But um, we'll give final word for everybody. Um, what's what's one kind of underrated factor? Um, you know, we've talked about ratings and rankings. We've talked about academics. If you could name one underrated factor that that you you think about personally, or you know other people think about uh, when it comes to uh, recruiting your players, what what would that be? Um, Wendy, we'll start with you. We'll go in the same order. Wendy, Aaron, Sean, Bassani. I'll say this. I've been uh, coaching since 1984. And back then we had about 15 women's team teams. Uh, the two uh, men's and women's were separate. And since 1984, that number has doubled in size. So it is really exciting to see how many college squash teams there are out there. Um, 30 years ago, it was very, very limited. Now, really, the sky's the limit. So I would just say there is something for everyone. And nobody should panic because they didn't get into a certain school. There is something for every one of you out there that will offer great academics, great squash, and a really good time. Thanks, Wendy. Aaron? Um, yeah, I agree with Wendy, um, and it's it's just, uh, I know I said this before, it's, it's super exciting for me to see how many um, juniors are playing all across the U.S. because that has changed a lot since I got into coaching a long time ago, and um, and it's our job to, you know, help you all find, you know, the right program for you. And, um, and this is just so good for the game of squash to keep everybody involved. So um, the good thing is, and this was mentioned before, I think by David, that most of the um, college squash teams um, are at institutions that are highly um, academically competitive and in great schools and have lots to offer. So just keep an open mind, you know, as you're doing your search, um, you know, try not to get stuck on, you know, a few programs because um, there's just, uh, there's a lot of good options and it's just a matter of finding the best fit for you academically and athletically. Thanks, Aaron. Sean? Sean, you're mm -hmm. on mute. There you go. Hey, I lost my mouse for a second, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think college squash is probably the best, how you can quantify that squash product in the world, you know, it's exciting, there's tradition, there's history, rivalries. And so, you know, for me, it's the most transformative experience of my of my life, really, which is why I'm, you know, kind of back doing this. Um, you know, so I think all of you to, you know, to Aaron and Wendy's points, I think all of you have a have a home somewhere. And, you know, expanding your view of that, I think is important. You know, I think to answer, um, you know, David's question, you know, a little more precisely, um, I think character is critically important. I want the right people in my locker room at all times. And, you know, how we quantify that and measure that, you know, is a, is a really difficult thing to do. But how you behave at tournaments and, you know, your body language on court and your interactions with referees and things like that, I think is very undervalued. Um, and we take that very seriously. So, um, but have fun doing it. It's great. It's great. You're, you're applying at the pinnacle of college squash. I'm kind of jealous. I wish I'd been, you know, 12 years younger, 15 years younger. Thanks, Sean. Bassani. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say, um, I think similar to what a lot of coaches have said, um, I think doing your research on, you know, on all the institutions is, is quite, it's quite important. I think sometimes people get disappointed when they don't end up um, where, you know, where their parents want them to be. I, I think um, there is a home for everyone. And, um, you know, and sometimes I think just because, you know, your high schools are different and sometimes someone, you know, may be a strong academic at one school, um, you know, I think a lot of the colleges are tough academically and, you know, just keep an open mind when you're going through this process because at one school you could be called, you know, a B band at one school, you could be called an A band. I think try and get an understanding from coaches as well, you know, what some of the terminology that, you know, what some of the terminology means, because 
Um, you know, I, I've sensed that some students think, oh, I should be an A band, it's all means getting A's. Um, but um, the second, um, yeah, you know, when you're being recruited, you're going to be in a program for four years. Um, you know, so we look quite closely, um, you know, at the character of the person. And, um, you know, we, I personally look for the, at the person first um, and, um, you know, think, uh, you know, think hard about that. Well, we've, we've hit 801. So uh, I'm, again, very grateful for these coaches and their perspectives and their, their willingness to share it with you this evening. Um, as you can tell, there's, there's lots and lots of different factors that play into the college recruitment. Um, academics is, is very high on the list. Character and citizenship is very high on the list. And, and without a doubt, squash is high on the list too, but it's a, it becomes a total package question. And um, there's, no, there's no silver bullet that's gonna work with every school. You're gonna have to do your research and, and, um, and get to know the places where you really feel like you fit. But the, the great thing is, and, and I appreciate uh, the coaches bringing this up, there are so many great options out there. Um, college squash is, is geared to really take off um, over the next few years. And we're excited that all of you are, are interested and, and keen to get involved. And um, we're just, uh, we're, we're happy, we're happy that you're all here and, and trying to learn and, and make, prepare yourselves to be part of the journey with us. So thank you again. Any questions, um, there's a resources tab on the College Squash Association website, csasquash.com. Um, there are resources on the US Squash website. We'll share it. Uh, we'll share this link to the video. You can share with your peers and friends and coaches. Um, really any question that you have, we can answer and we're here, we're here to help. So don't hesitate. Thank you all again for, for participating and attending this evening. And we look forward to seeing you out there soon. Um, take good care, be safe.